My name is Alexander Feldman. I'm the president and CEO of the U.S. ASEAN Business Council. And I want to welcome you to the official launch event for the fifth edition of ASEAN Matters. <clears throat> ASEAN Matters is our flagship publication, explores the increasingly important relationship between the United States and the 10 Southeast Asian nations of ASEAN across economic, <clears throat> excuse me, diplomatic, strategic, cultural, and social dimensions. We are proud to collaborate once again with the East West Center and ICS Yusuf Ishak Institute to publish this amb amb uh, ambitious project, uh, which illustrates how ASEAN and the United States impact one another in increasingly dynamic ways. Before I, we get started, I would like to let all of our friends uh, and colleagues across Southeast Asia and the United States know that we're thinking of you in these challenging times. With COVID-19 on the rise across Southeast Asia and indeed even here in the United States, we are at the council are doing all we can to assist from our side and provide needed supplies to ASEAN nations uh, as they move forward this latest challenge. Over the course of the next 90 minutes, we will hear from a mix of government and private sector leaders on the importance of, the ASEAN, of ASEAN to the United States and vice versa. This publication is really filled with, to the brim with data about the immense opportunity in ASEAN. ASEAN has the third largest population in the world with 662 million people. Over 380 million of those are under the age of 35, making it one of the youngest regions in the world. In fact, roughly 20%, it's roughly 20% larger than the population of the United States. That's just the young people in Southeast Asia. As the ASEAN economy is projected to grow 5.5% to become the fourth largest economy in the world by 2050, even despite the challenges of COVID. ASEAN is also the number one destination for US investment in the Indo-Pacific. ASEAN received more than $338 billion in US foreign direct investment, which is more than the US has invested in China, India, Japan, and South Korea combined. That, that number just floors me every time I say it. But again, we have invested more in Southeast Asia, more in ASEAN than we have in China, India, Japan, and South Korea combined. And ASEAN is the fourth largest export market for US goods after Canada, Mexico, and China, another number that shouldn't be dismissed quickly. In all, the relationship supports more than 600,000 American jobs. As you can see, this region of the world continues to be one of the of utmost importance to the United States and to our private sector. In wrapping up, I'd like to thank and recognize our sponsors. Our platinum sponsors include Google, MSD, and Viatris. Our gold sponsors include AIG, Chevron, and Coca-Cola. And our silver sponsors include 3M, Citi, HP, Marriott, Oracle, UL, Visa, and VMware. We could not have gotten to this point without you. And I want to just thank from the bottom of my heart, all of our sponsors. And now it's my great pleasure to turn the floor over to my partner in crime, Satu Lamai from the East West Center. Well, thank you very much, Alex. And thank you for your uh, kind remarks. Welcome everyone from wherever and whatever time you're joining us. My name is Satu Lamai. I'm the vice president of the East West Center and also the director of the East West Center in Washington. It's an absolute delight to launch this fifth edition of the ASEAN Matters for America, America Matters for ASEAN. Uh, for us at the East West Center, this is part of our flagship initiative called Asia Matters for America. And I want to call out not only Alex Feldman and his entire team at the US ASEAN Business Council, but our very good colleagues uh, represented here today by Sharon Lilian Sia of the Yusuf Ishak Institute, who have also been partners from the beginning on the uh, ASEAN Matters for America project. And of course, the entire East West Center team uh, that has supported the publication and the website. I hope you'll appreciate that this, um, this publication and website is part of our overall mission uh, assigned by Congress to promote better relations and understanding between the peoples and governments of the United States and Asia. And this flagship initiative uh, is part of the Asia Matters for America series, which maps out 
US-Asia interactions across countries at the national, state, and local levels. So thank you for joining us. Thank you for our partners and all the sponsors of our partners um, at ICs and USABC. Um, we are uh, going to start this morning with a real highlight, which is uh, three eminent speakers, um, two of them currently serving in their respective governments and one who has had long experience in the US government for a fireside chat on new directions in US-Southeast Asia relations. If I read their bios fully, it would take the entire time allotted. So I'm going to just mention that in order of speaking for the fireside chat, we have, and I'll ask them to come on camera as I introduce them, we have Ambassador Ashok Mirpuri, Singapore's current ambassador to the United States since July 2012. So he's had uh, quite long innings here, uh, well-experienced, well-known diplomat, serving many positions in his government's foreign service. We also have Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for South and Southeast Asia, Lindsay Ford, uh, who had a previous stint in the Office of the Secretary of Defense working uh, the US ASEAN defense issues, but now is back as the DASD and uh, delighted to have uh, Ms. Ford with us. And last but not at all least is our good colleague and friend, uh, Barbara Weisel, who as many of you know, was the lead negotiator for the Trans-Pacific Partnership for the United States and is currently a managing partner at Rock Creek Global. So as you can see, just an enormous wealth of experience uh, but we can only take advantage of it for approximately 20 minutes. So here we go. I'm going to just um, start uh, in the spirit of actually in a DC summer, it should not be called a fireside chat, but rather an air conditioner chat. But let's start with Ambassador Mirpuri. Uh, as you know, the Biden administration has had two major Asia interactions in Washington, two summits with Japan and the ROK uh, leaders, respectively, as well as a quad leaders meeting. Uh, we're getting revved up on Southeast Asia as we go into the season of summits and other meetings, as you know, have been going on over the last few weeks. How would you characterize the state of U.S.-Southeast Asia relations today, and what new directions would you propose, given your perspective on the relationship? Thank you, Satu, and thank you for inviting me to speak this morning at the very important launch of the fifth edition of the ASEAN Matters for America. And I congratulate USABC together with East West Center and the Yusuf Insap Institute from Singapore for putting this together. It's been an essential resource every time I travel outside Washington DC to tell people how the relationship is between ASEAN and the United States. So I, I really find it a useful sort of summary of everything going on. Now, looking at the Biden administration, I think Everyone on this uh, chat would know that the U.S. has always been a key partner for Russia. American support brought free trade, major investments over the decades into Southeast Asia, together with peace, stability, and prosperity. And the whole region has been a beneficiary of American engagement with the region. Now, the Biden administration has stepped this up a notch, as you mentioned, they have engaged the first leaders to come to Washington, D.C., were from the Asia Pacific, Prime Minister Suga and President Moon, as well as the Quad Leader Summit that they did virtually. And there's ongoing engagement. As you mentioned, Secretary Austin is on the way to Singapore next week, and there will be more meetings and visits over the course of the next few months. I think that, that what has been important in terms of what the United States want to do with the region, we really have to focus on two or three different areas as we go ahead. This administration has started on some of these areas, and I congratulate them for what they have done domestically in the US. But I think three key areas will be important, particularly as we deal coming out of the pandemic. First, obviously, is vaccines, COVID, dealing with COVID and vaccines. There has been an initial start for what the administration has been offering to Southeast Asia and Southeast Asian countries. I think more needs to be done. Uh, Alex mentioned the urgency in some of the Southeast Asian countries. It has been the defining crisis of our generation. And where the U.S. can come in and help, I think that would be very critical. Now, and not just the U.S., but working with other partners in the region as well as from outside the region. So sending those vaccines there. And then to start thinking, once we get out of the pandemic, what is the post-economic recovery that needs to be done? because this has set back our economies by a generation at least. And we need to think about how we can we get movement and back on. 
Following from dealing with COVID, the next area is really about digitalization and cybersecurity. The pandemic has shown how important e-commerce is, how important the digital world is. And I think the United States can lead the way in working with the region and setting standards about cybersecurity, about the digital economy. You have in ASEAN a growing digital market. And whatever that can be done as the economies come out, looking at the digital future will be important. And working with countries like Singapore, say in cyber policy dialogues, which we have set up. There's an ASEAN Singapore Cybersecurity Center of Excellence, which the US has worked at. So COVID, cyber, and the third area is really a longer term concern, but has to be dealt with immediately, is climate change. The administration has put climate change at the top of its agenda here in the United States and what they want to do in the world. Southeast Asian countries are very vulnerable to what is happening on climate change. If we don't get started today, I think we're going to lose ground Prime Minister Lee Hsien Loong of Singapore was invited by President Biden to speak at the Leaders Summit on Climate, and he spoke on some of the areas of innovation. So really some areas in which we, the, the three sort of areas I think we should focus on is COVID, cyber, and climate. And that I think will give a good agenda for what this administration wants to do moving ahead. Thank you. Ambassador, can I just follow up one question? Could we have a word from you given that as you mentioned, and I didn't want to um, preempt uh, Dasby Ford's comments on uh, the Secretary of Defense's visit, but since he has announced publicly that he's going to visit Singapore, quite apart from the three general issues that you raised for all of Southeast Asia, could I ask you to say a word about what you are expecting um, for the U.S.-Singapore relationship on the SecDef's visit from a Singaporean perspective, given your recent uh, renewal of the five agreements that we have in our strategic framework agreement and um, related matters. Please, just to follow Thank up. you. Well, we've had a long-standing defense relationship with the United States, one that dates back to 1990 and takes a long-term view of this. Uh, we extended that engagement to 2035 when the prime minister met President Trump in New York two years ago. And it's something that we really value in terms of keeping the US actively engaged in Southeast Asia. So I expect that Secretary Austin and I would look forward to hearing what Dusty Ford says about this as well. He is planning to give a speech, but he will reinforce some of the areas of cooperation, not just for Singapore, but more widely. What are we going to do with information security, with counterterrorism? These are areas of important consideration, not just for Singapore, but the whole region. So we are looking forward to the visit. It does, it will be the first cabinet secretary from the United States visiting the ASEAN countries. And I think that it is an important signal of how ASEAN plays in the US administration's agenda. Thank you, Ambassador Mirpuri. We're all looking forward to the secretary's visit and his remarks. And that's a perfect segue into uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense, Lindsay Ford. Lindsay, thanks so much for uh, joining us this morning. Um, and over to you, I wanted to sort of build on this uh, segue. He's announced the planned trip. Um, what priorities can we expect at the Fullerton speech? As you know, he's going to give the major address there, first cabinet uh, member of the Biden administration to do so. And particularly, you know, the, the, the Defense Department, as you know, has identified the Indo-Pacific theater as its primary theater. Um, uh, the secretary's comments have spoken about the pacing threat and and strategic competition and um, integrated deterrence. How will this play into the Secretary's business? Over to you. Thanks, Satu. Um, and, and thank you to, to you and Alex. I, I would just echo uh, Ambassador Mirpuri's comments that um, I, I find the publication that you put out to be immensely valuable. Um, I, I am also constantly surprised. I see the data points and even as somebody who follows the region closely, um, I'm, I'm always amazed uh, when I see stuff that I didn't know. Uh, and, and you look at the numbers and they're incredibly impressive. So I just, I really appreciate the work that you guys do. And so thanks for having me here. Um, I guess to your point, yes, the secretary is headed out to the region next week. Uh, Singapore, the Philippines, and Vietnam. We're very excited about this trip. It's his second to Asia, but his first to Southeast Asia, and he'll be the first uh, cabinet official from the Biden administration to head out to Southeast Asia. Um, we, we had obviously hoped to be there uh, slightly sooner, 
but we uh, we we um, after after the unfortunate um, cancellation of the Shangri-La dialogue, or are getting back to the region as soon as we can. So we're we're really happy to be doing this, and we're really happy for the opportunity for the secretary to offer some remarks when he's in the region. I think um, in terms of our priorities and what you're going to hear from the secretary, I would just highlight uh, three things. Um, I think there's a there's a decent amount of overlap with the comments that you heard from Ambassador Murpuri, so that makes me feel better uh, that, that we're not totally off base, hopefully. Um, but I think our emphasis is going to be on a few things um, that really, I think, where the United States has a shared interest with our partners is in seeing a region uh, that is resilient, that is open and secure. Uh, and, and I think those are the, the top things that we're focused on, um, resilience. Resilience really has to do with the ability um, of an individual, of a region to withstand diversity and, and to have the ability to bounce back. Um, and as the ambassador said, I think we're all very cognizant that we're in a moment where we are, we have been facing a historic crisis, still are, um, and that the United States sees our role as working with partners to ensure um, that everyone has the tools that they need to come back from this crisis as strong as possible. So the administration has certainly been very focused on um, trying to share vaccines with the region. The president has made announcements on, on the global uh, efforts that we are making, but there are ones that are, are very specific to uh, Asia as well. So, um, you know, there, there is a quad vaccine initiative that, that will help with production and sharing um, of vaccines specifically in the Asia Pacific region. We've also been working through COVAX um, and just in the last couple months, um, you know, have, have seen over 10 million doses of vaccines going specifically in, into the region. Um, and there will be more to come. For the Department of Defense, obviously uh, vaccine production is not what we do, but we're working um, together with partners and the secretary will talk about this to look at areas where we can assist with logistics, with training, um, you know, to really capitalize on the unique roles that militaries have um, to help uh, provide some of these public goods. So resilience is really, I think, the, the first priority for us um, in showing up for our partners in a moment where it really counts. Um, second is openness. And here, I think in particular, we're very focused on the fact that, as you said, uh, the openness uh, of Southeast Asia is something that has benefited the United States tremendously over decades. Um, it's something on which our own security and prosperity relies and something I, I think that's incredibly uh, important for Southeast Asia and, and its own prosperity as well. So in particular, I think we've been concerned about recent events in places like the South China Sea as well as in cyberspace um, where the openness uh, that all of us benefit from has been challenged. Um, and for the Department of Defense, I think we want to talk with partners about how we ensure that there are fair and equitable rules of the road for how we operate in the maritime domain and how we operate in cyberspace. Um, and, and that's something we're going to be talking closely with partners about, as well as ensuring that they have the capabilities that they need um, to make sure that we're all uh, playing by, um, I guess, a, a level playing field. And then finally, security. You mentioned that the secretary has talked about integrated deterrence. I know that that can sort of raise questions sometimes as to what, do, what is that? What does it mean? Um, in simple terms, his, you know, his emphasis is, is on saying that militaries exist so that hopefully we have the kinds of capabilities that we need to let diplomacy do its work um, and to allow countries to focus on prosperity and the advancement and well-being of their people. Um, so when he says integrated, I think one thing he is very um, cognizant of is that we want to be talking with partners about how uh, we ensure that the work we do on the defense side supports the work that is done on the diplomatic and, and economic side. That we recognize that a lot of the security challenges we face cross civilian and military lines, uh, problems like military militia, problems that we see in cyberspace. Uh, it's not a neat sort of defense uh, lane, and so we want to support the other um, the other elements of, of the interagency there. Um, and then also, you know, thinking about how we work together with partners to meet their security needs. So I know there's sometimes a concern that this is about the US and China, but we want to talk about a deterrence in a way that recognizes that the broader emphasis is on stability and whether that is dealing with climate change, whether that is dealing with violent extremism, there are a lot of kinds of uh, threats and challenges that we wanna work alongside partners to deter, to maintain the stability that we've enjoyed in the region for decades.
I'll stop there. Thanks, Patu. Well, thank you very much, uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary. That's wonderful comments. Let me just follow up with one thing. Um, obviously, um, as you well know, you are such an experienced hand and expert at Southeast Asia. Uh, people in the region are watching very, very carefully um, where the first visit is, what obviously the SECDEF says, you know that you know, great um, Southeast Asianology is committed in these visits. And I wanted to follow up about the selection of the three countries are obviously a longtime ally. Uh, in the case of the Philippines, a strategic partner in the case of, of Singapore, and obviously a very much developing partnership um, with the Vietnam. Can you say a little bit in this public setting about posture and access issues and how that uh, is going to be framed in the Fullerton speech that has been highlighted as a, as a speech about partnership? And you mentioned that word. How, how do you think that element will be dealt with in terms of our, our posture forward? Sure, thank you. Well, I, you know, I know that um, I know there's always interest in um, in where you stop and why. Um, I think, as you said, uh, as you said, Satu, the three places, the three countries where we're going, I think, demonstrate um, the breadth and the range of the relationships that we have in Southeast Asia. Um, from a long-standing ally in the Philippines, a close partner like Singapore that has really enabled a lot of our foreign uh, forward presence for decades, and Vietnam which is a relationship that has been newer on the security side, but I think we view as, as very important in the future. Um, in terms of forward presence, uh, the department certainly is, is cognizant of the fact uh, that our forward presence has been something that has not only enabled our own security, but has brought stability to the region uh, for a long time. Uh, and we're focused on sustaining that presence and uh, you know, I think looking at ways to enhance it in the future. Um, Singapore has been one of our closest partners in ensuring that the United States can be forward and present in the region. Um, you know, and, and I, I think that you will uh, hear the secretary um, emphasize not just our commitment to stay forward in the region, but in thinking about ways that as we are present and forward in the region, we can increasingly operate with partners uh, collectively in a networked way. Uh, partners uh, in Southeast Asia and across the region. So it's not simply about the United States being there, but what we do alongside our allies and partners when we were there. Well, thank you so much, uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary Ford. I really appreciate you taking the time and, and, and I know you have um, a very busy schedule this morning. So thank you. And I, I know you may have to log off uh, when you are called away. In any case, it was great pleasure now to turn to Ms. Barbara Weisel. Um, many of you know, I've already introduced her. I wanna go straight to the question. Barbara, quite apart from all of these wonderful relationships and the defense and security side, um, Ambassador Mirpuri flagged the economic recovery. Post-pandemic economic recovery is gonna be on everyone's minds, huge issue for the world, certainly Southeast Asia. Southeast Asia has moved ahead with RCEP, moved ahead, some members of some member countries of ASEAN have moved ahead with CPTPP. US is not a party to either. Uh, China has naturally become a major economic factor uh, globally, but certainly in Southeast Asia. How would you assess the current state of US Southeast Asia commercial ties, uh, including trade and investment? And what should we prioritize now? Mir Ambassador Mirpuri mentioned digital trade. But in addition to that, what else? What else should we be doing? What should the administration be thinking about? Well, thanks, Satu, and thanks, Alex. I, I too am very delighted to be part of today's event and have myself been a long fan of ASEAN Matters for America. Um, when I was in the government, I found this publication extremely useful in educating policymakers. As Dasty Ford just said, people are always surprised about the statistics that are in there and the significance of the relationship broadly. And I think there's no better way to show it than a small document like that, that really just focuses clearly in on underscoring that value. So um, we're looking forward to seeing the update. On, um, on your question on the relationship and, and where things stand, I guess what I would say is that um, the US trade and investment relationship remains strong, notwithstanding the fact that the US is not part of either of the emerging economic architectures in the region. And I think that you know, the countries sense that 
the U.S. is considering the direction it wants to take in Asia and um, including on economic issues. I mean, we're watching what's going on on the defense and security side, but I think there's a sense that the U.S. hasn't paid sufficient attention um, to the economic aspects of the relationship. So trade and investment going on, but they'd like to see more from the United States. And now we have this, an opportunity with this administration focused on Asia to address those concerns. Um, I wanted to provide some thoughts on that. Um, and, and I will agree wholeheartedly with Ambassador Morpuri's comments. Um, and I wanted to add a few other points um, that I think are aligned with the priorities that Kurt Campbell has laid out for the region. And you know, the first is just engagement, in, enhancing engagement with the region. Lots of people talk about just getting ourselves out there and being there. I think it would be really useful to convene a US ASEAN economic forum. You know, there were meetings like this during the Obama administration. People remember the Sunnyland Summit. Uh, I think this would be a, a really appropriate time to look at doing that, if not across the relationship, certainly on the economic side um, and bringing very, very senior level cabinet officials and, and other senior officials together to talk about areas that we can be working together. And I'm talking here about the Development Finance Corporation, XM, Small Business Administration, and USTDA alongside Commerce, USTR, and others, but to just have a high level summit to talk about the relationship and maybe even alongside of it, have a business element to that so that senior business leaders can connect with government officials to talk about how they can contribute to the joint agenda. Um, as part of that, I think it would be useful to discuss the trade and investment framework agreement. I know that um, those discussions have been going on, but it's an important time to have a framework for economic engagement. And that, that framework is out there. It's time to rejuvenate. It could be part of discussions between the US and senior level officials. I agree completely with Ambassador Murpuri on the importance of the, the digital transformation and focus on the digital economy. Um, he he um, mentioned some areas where there could be work. You know, uh, the US, as, as you've seen in the press, is, is at least um, considering the possibility of a US-Asia digital trade agreement. And I, I assume that that would include Singapore as well as potentially other countries in, in um, Southeast Asia and around the region. Um, but as that consideration goes underway, I think the US and ASEAN can continue to discuss other digital governance issues that affect all of them and that would allow for greater interoperability of their systems, common principles on things like privacy that that can be discussed in among all of the countries, even if they're not party to a trade agreement. You know, many of the countries in ASEAN are part of the APEC um, cross-border privacy regime. Not all of the ASEANs are, are APEC members, so not party to that, but they could ex extend the APEC regime to include them and to make sure that there's just common approaches to digital issues across the region. Um, another priority that was mentioned was climate. Um, I think there, there is work already on clean energy. I think that work could be stepped up and, and some uh, efforts on a US ASEAN clean energy partnership could be pursued. And a final area that I just wanna mention is on supply chain. There is a lot of discussion going on on supply chains between the United States and many different partners. ASEAN is not among them, but there is work to be done with ASEAN partners on how to build uh, trusted supply chains. And I think we shouldn't leave ASEAN out of those discussions. We should find a way to engage with them on areas of common interest. Let me stop there. Barbara, thank you so much for that terrific roadmap on the economic part of our relationship. I, there's so much more we could pull the thread on, uh, WTO reform, um, uh, supply chain is really important. I know that countries in the region I, I've been speaking with do want to talk about that and, and want to work with the U.S. On, on that. So I wish we had the time 
but I realize our next speaker has also a very uh, hard stop this morning. So let me just say thank you, Ambassador Mirpuri. Thank you, Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for South and Southeast Asia, Lindsay Ford, and Ms. Barbara Weisel for your absolutely terrific air conditioner chat this morning. Uh, I know you've given us a lot uh, of guidance on the next new directions and next steps in U.S. Southeast Asia relations. I only wish we had more time to engage, but let me move forward with the program. And that is to introduce um, uh, Mr. Karan Bhatia, who is the Vice President for Government Affairs and Public Policy at Google, where he advises the leadership on a number of issues. He has also had extensive experience in the private sector um, and was served in the US government at Department of Commerce, Transportation, and Deputy US Trade Representative. So, so much experience, so much expertise to be managed in 10 minutes. Karan, thanks for your uh, presence here. Thanks for your support of this project. Over to you, sir. Sasha, thanks so much. Can you, can you hear me? Absolutely, very well. Okay, great, good, thanks. So uh, look, good morning, everyone. Uh, and thanks so much for, for the introduction. Again, I uh, have the privilege of leading the government affairs and public policy function over here at Google. And let me join others in extending my appreciation to uh, the East West Center, U.S. ASEAN Business Council, ICS, uh, Yusuf Ishak Institute for, for uh, this event today. I, too, am a great fan of ASEAN Matters and um, have enjoyed following it over the years. Um, look, I think a number of the comments uh, that preceded mine sort of provide a good summary of the um, general trajectory, the importance of the region, the optimism that I think many companies feel about the growth that we're seeing. And so I just thought I would briefly take a moment to focus on, on one part of that, uh, which Ambassador Mirpuri alluded to in particular, which is the digital economy. Um, and first of all, just to note that even with uh, the setbacks and challenges that COVID has presented writ large to the region and, and to the United States as well, this is a space that has continued to, to uh, not to just uh, exist, but, but to grow. Um, we've, seen, we've seen a stepped up acceleration in uh, digital commerce um, and in the utility of the internet in people's lives. Just think for a moment of how we've adjusted over the course of the past uh, couple of years through four like these becoming online through education uh, moving online. So there's just been a, a lot of momentum there. And we, we've actually been looking at this for a little while in partner, partnership with Tomasic and with Bain. Uh, it culminated in a report that we put out called Economy SEA uh, back in 2020. And you know, the, let me just throw a few facts out for everybody because I think they really are uh, sort of, they, they make you wake up. The, 40 million people started using the internet for the first time in 2020 compared mm. to 10 million in 2019. So a four-fold increase just in that one-year period. More users outside of urban centers are coming online at a greater rate than before. So Indonesia, Malaysia, the Philippines, more than half of the people that are new to digital services now live in non-metropolitan areas. Um, and I think what's most promising is that this change is really set to be a permanent shift that's gonna, gonna stick. You know, eight out of 10 people across the region uh, said that technology helped them get through the virus. And, and out of that, nine out of 10 plan to keep using at least one digital service beyond the pandemic. So, you know, with the increasing number of users that we see in the region, I think it's it's no surprise that the internet economy has grown from 38 billion in 2019, 62 billion in 2020, expected to reach 170 plus billion in 2025. So for purposes of, of, of this gathering, you know, what, what I would ask people to think about is what do we need to do to continue to drive this and make it sustainable? And I would flag two things in particular. First, as the role of technology in Southeast Asia grows, I, we have to equip people with skills and skills to navigate that digital economy, that new economy with confidence. Um, so at Google, we believe that everyone has a role to play uh, in this, certainly including uh, platforms like ours. And, and to that end, we've been grateful for the partnership we've had with governments and with other businesses and with the nonprofit sector to try and close that skill gap, expand opportunity. Just a few of the things we've been doing with Singapore and with Thailand, we've launched 
programs like Skills Ignition in, in Singapore, Safan Digital in Thailand to bring together government agencies and coalition of businesses uh, to help workers and, and business owners reskill. In Indonesia, uh, we've partnered with a number of other major local tech companies like Gojek and Tokopedia to develop young digital talent, um, just expanded that program this year. And then on a cross ASEAN basis, we've been supporting the Asia Foundation to work with local nonprofits across the whole region to help uh, more than 200,000 small and medium-sized businesses and workers get the skills that they need to digitize. So uh, that's just one example. There's a lot more, a lot of other companies, a lot of other agencies are doing, but it is exciting to see the momentum in this place and important that we continue to see governments make that digital skilling priority, a priority in their own economic recovery plan uh, going forward. So that's one. Uh, the second thing I would just say is the continued success and growth um, of, of, of ASEAN and the United States which is, is I think critically tied to um, pursuing and, and driving an open interoperable internet framework and particularly one around digital trade. And look, I, I can't let the opportunity pass without noting that digital trade agreements um, have presented that opportunity an opportunity to ensure that governments don't turn inward um, and, and that they set positive norms. And look, the risk of fragmentation uh, of the internet does exist. And I would say it, it uh, particularly exists in the Asia Pacific region where we've seen several countries, you know, rush into regulate uh, unilaterally on issues ranging from content online to competition without any clear mechanism for coordinating and aligning around common principles and standards. And so, you know, a digital trade agreement as was mentioned previously between the United States and like-minded countries in the region could help address this coordination challenge would give governments, I think, the tools they need to effectively address uh, these issues in the digital sector, but also reinforce durable trade principles like non-discrimination, national treatment, and, uh, and interoperability as examples. Um, and they, they also can be used to promote really positive models of digital trade, both in terms of reflecting a values-oriented approach to trade, but also you know, a, a human worker centered digital trade agenda and and, you know, trade agreements in the past have often had sort of high level hortatory language about small businesses. Now here, there's a real opportunity for the US and like minded countries to develop a new model of digital trade agreement that's more impactful, I'd say for the average small business and worker by ensuring that they all have access to the digital trade tools that they need to grow. So so look, I, I, I will keep my remarks brief as, as instructed, uh, but I would close by saying, I think the time is right for this new level of focus um, and initiative on digital trade. Um, we can build off an already strong foundation of regional trade initiatives focused on this space, including things like the ASEAN e-commerce agreement, uh, DEPA, obviously the Australia Singapore agreement. So, so there's already a good history of governments having led in this space. We think this is a win-win space. Um, and, and lastly, I would just say it's clear that the region's future is a digital economy or the region's future is as a digital economy. It's got a young population that's driving how people, not just in the region, but around the world are using the Internet. Um, and in many ways, Southeast Asia is already leading the world uh, in, in e-commerce and, and delivery as an example. So excited to see uh, this this topic come to the fore. And uh, just can reassure you that we at Google remain committed to, to all of you, the institutions represented here today to be a partner in, in this effort going forward. Thanks so much. Karen, thank you so much. Thank you for Google and your support of this project. Thank you for your comments, which uh, sort of align wonderfully with those that proceeded in the air conditioner chat uh, on openness, cybersecurity, digital futures, uh, post-pandemic economic recovery and skills development. It's really terrific. And uh, thank you uh, again for this morning. I know you have a, also a very constrained schedule, so I uh, appreciate you taking the time. Thank you. Uh, folks, um, I mean, we almost have 261 folks logged on to this uh, virtual program, uh, which is an amazing testament to uh, digital um, engagement. And uh, so we now turn to four messages, recorded messages from members of Congress. We have Senator Tammy Duckworth, U.S. Senator from Illinois, uh, Chairman Gregory Meeks, representing, uh, representing the 5th District in New York, 
is also chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee. Representative Young Kim, California 39 District, 39th District, who is a member of the House Foreign Affairs Subcommittee on Asia and the Pacific, uh, Central Asia and Non-Proliferation. And Representative Ami Bera from California 7th District, who is the chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Subcommittee on Asia Pacific. So you can see we have an outstanding group of members of Congress kindly giving messages to us on the occasion of ASEAN Matters for America, America Matters for ASEAN launch. Thank you for joining us and over to uh, Patrick Khan, who I believe will load up the videos and have them uh, shared with us. Hello, everyone. I'm happy to be speaking to you today as the East West Center, the US ASEAN Business Council, and the Isaiah's Yusuf Shock launches their fifth edition of the ASEAN Matters for America, American Matters for ASEAN publication. This report is a valuable resource that represents the hard work done here with these organizations and demonstrates just how intertwined our interests across the US are with our partners in ASEAN. Our nation has had tied with ASEAN countries since the early days of our founding. For instance, just this year, the United States commemorated nearly 190 years of friendly and formal relations with Thailand. As you mean, you may know, I'm American, but I was born in Thailand and spent much of my childhood growing up in Southeast Asia. So these relationships are very meaningful to me. My Thai heritage makes me a living example of the friendships between our two nations. Thanks to my early connections and my continued work in public service, I know very well how the United States and many of our allies and partners in Southeast Asia have helped one another to grow and evolve. Countries whom we've, we've worked with over the years, decades, and even centuries in the name of common sense and for the sake of the common good. At the federal government level, we've been talking for years across presidential administrations of both parties about the importance of strengthening our relationship in the Indo-Pacific region in general and in Southeast Asia in particular. Right now, this ASEAN Matters for America publication does a phenomenal job of showing how strong those ties already are on so many levels, from trade and industry to education to tourism and the people to people connections that drive so many of our relationships and goodwill among us. It shows the, econo the economic value of our relationships on a state by state basis and it illustrates opportunities to grow in these ties as we continue to invest in ASEAN with our economic, diplomatic, and military engagements. Every state in our union has ties to ASEAN countries, and this publication demonstrates the breadth of those ties. These are just a few of the reasons why I'm so grateful to be part of this event today, and why I'm so grateful that you all have taken an interest not only in what we are explicitly America's interests, but in the values of our lasting and growing relationships in ASEAN as well. Because at the end of the day, they are often one and the same. Thank you, and I hope you find as much value in this publication as I do. Thank you to the East West Center and the U.S. ASEAN Business Council for hosting me today for the launch of the fifth edition of this premier resource. I'm happy to be with so many friends today as we underscore the important ties between the United States and Southeast Asia. I've witnessed the benefits of U.S. ASEAN engagement firsthand. I come from a district with a vibrant population that represents the full diversity of America, and many of my constituents possess deep ties to Southeast Asia. For more than 40 years, the United States has bolstered its engagement with Southeast Asia bilaterally and multilaterally toward our shared objective of a peaceful and prosperous region and bilateral ties characterized by cooperation, as well as people and cultural exchange. I am particularly struck by the progress we have made over the past couple of decades. Our commercial and economic ties have paved the way for significant benefits for both sides. In 2019, for instance, the United States exported over $105 billion in goods and services to the region, making ASEAN our fourth largest trading partner. Trade with ASEAN has supported over a half million American jobs. With the world's third largest population, Southeast Asia remains a vital partner for trade and investment. And we must do more to enhance our trade and investment relationship. 
Southeast Asia will also continue to serve as an important partner for the United States on critical issues such as climate change, disaster management, peace and security, and global health. I fundamentally believe that U.S. ASEAN cooperation is critical for the broader Indo-Pacific. This is why Congress must act to ensure that we remain engaged with the region. We must emphasize the critical role ASEAN plays in the broader Indo-Pacific. The United States and its partners need to work proactively with our Southeast Asian partners to promote the norms, rules, and standards that will drive the region in the years and decades to come. For that to happen, both sides need to revitalize internally and redouble their international engagement to navigate the challenges we are facing together. For ASEAN, this will require creative maneuvering and diplomacy to showcase to the world that it is committed to and capable of addressing tough challenges. This includes standing strong against China's maritime aggression in the South China Sea, as well as addressing the coup and crises in Burma. In the weeks and months ahead, the world will be looking at ASEAN to help bring about a cessation of violence, the release of those unjustly detained, and a pathway back to democratic transition. For the United States, the task is to demonstrate leadership in the region once more. So I'm committed to ensuring that the United States listens, shows up, and works to bolster our cooperation across the wide spectrum of interests that we have and share. Finally, American policymakers must be clear-eyed about the importance of the United States ASEAN engagement for our mutual benefit separate from the context of U.S.-China competition. So I hope you all have a productive and constructive day of discussions to bolster this critical partnership. And I thank you for allowing me to say a few words. Have a good one. I'm Congressman Ami Barra of California's 7th Congressional District and Chairman of the House Subcommittee on Asia and the Pacific, Central Asia and Nonproliferation. I want to thank um, ASEAN Matters to America and America Matters to ASEAN um, for providing me an opportunity to make a few comments. Um, as we think about the agenda of the 117th Congress as well as um, the sub subcommittee that I have a um, privilege of chairing, um, the importance of the ASEAN nations is incredibly important. As we confront um, the COVID-19 pandemic, there's nothing more important than for the United States to work in conjunction with the countries in the ASEAN region, as well as in broader Asia, to make sure we get vaccinations um, to the region. We have to defeat this pandemic, and our hearts go out to what we're seeing in the region right now, and certainly the suffering that America went through um, we don't want the region to suffer. So you know, we will continue to work with partners in the region to get vaccine to the region, but also with vaccine manufacturers in the broader Asia Pacific to produce vaccine. Secondly, as we've seen the importance of supply chains and supply chain redundancy, it's important for U.S. companies, along with um, the U.S. government and our um, strategic allies to start thinking about how we might partner with ASEAN um, nations to build some of these additional redundant supply chains to provide um, critical infrastructure for pharmaceuticals, for PPE, but also for things like semiconductors and, and, and other upstream um, manufacturing. So certainly I think there's an opportunity for the United States and the, the, at the government level, but also the business community to work with ASEAN nations where um, we can take advantage of the workforce in, in the ASEAN communities, as well as the, the strategic priorities in that region. Third, the subcommittee has taken a real interest in the importance of freedom of navigation, freedom of the movement of goods and services. The Indo-Pacific waterways are hugely important and the movement of goods through the South China Sea and through um, 
the Indo-Pacific is extremely important to the 21st century uh, economy. We, along with our um, allies in the region, have to work with the ASEAN nations to make sure those waterways are open, there's freedom of navigation, and there's um, maritime security. So we look forward to working with the countries in the region. And lastly, as we see threats to democracies, we see the suffering of the people of Myanmar, we want to work with a strong ASEAN as we make sure we address the issues of um, a rules-based order. We make sure that every um, human being in um, all the regions and countries in this um, in the ASEAN region can thrive and um, prosper in the 21st century. It's my hope that we build a strong U.S. ASEAN relationship, both from the diplomatic perspective, but also from the business perspective that allows all of us to thrive together and we make a better 21st century um, for our children and our future. Thank you again for allowing me to um, say a, a few brief comments about the importance um, that Congress places on a strong partnership with ASEAN nations. Um, I continue to look forward to working together with the governments and the businesses in this region and let's defeat this pandemic. Be safe, be kind to one another, and be well. Thank you. Good evening, and thank you for the opportunity to join you all here today to discuss U.S. involvement with ASEAN. ASEAN, as an organization, represents one of the most diverse collections of nations in the world, spanning different languages, religious beliefs, ethnicities, and political structures. Our country shares this belief of strength through diversity and cooperation. The United States is a great representation of how people from different backgrounds and beliefs can unify and support shared interests peacefully and for the greater good. As an organization, ASEAN has tremendous potential to influence change in the Indo-Pacific, both economically and diplomatically. As the United States continues to diversify its trade and development ties throughout the Indo-Pacific, the nations of ASEAN will be important partners to involve in strengthening economic ties. I also urge our partners in ASEAN to look into partnering with our Development Finance Corporation to finance higher risk development projects in developing nations so that we can continue to move more countries from receiving aid to engaging in trade. While trade between the United States and ASEAN continues to grow at a rapid pace, there are other areas of our relationship that need greater attention. Events over the past year have shown us that ASEAN cannot be ignored by the world. I'm struck by the continued violence and abuse that continues to affect the people of Myanmar as they try to restore representative government in their country. ASEAN matters. We can all agree that ASEAN has tremendous influence, not only in Southeast Asia, but around the world. Your founding declaration urges all nations to promote regional peace and stability through abiding respect for justice and the rule of law in the relationship among countries of the region and adherence to the principles of the United Nations Charter. I urge you to hold those principles in calling for justice in Myanmar to restoring the rule of law, respect for life and prosperity for its people. I look forward to working with you all in fostering a strong bond between the United Nations, United States, and ASEAN nations. Thank you. And thank you, Congresswoman, and thank you uh, to the other members of Congress and uh, Senator Duckworth and Satu, thanks again for your partnership. It's now my great pleasure to introduce uh, Congressman Steve Chabot, who represents the first district of Ohio, uh, a position he's held for over 24 years. Congressman Chabot currently serves as the ranking member of the House Foreign Affairs Committee on Asia, the Pacific, Central Asia, and nonproliferation. Uh, he is also the chair or co-chair of the Philippine Caucus in the United States Congress. Sure. Congressman Chabot has served as chairman of the House Subcommittee on Small Business from 2015 to 2018. He served as chairman of the Judici Judiciary Subcommittee on the Constitution from 2001 to 2006. 
He served as chairman of the Foreign Affairs Subcommittee on Middle East and South Asia from 2011 to 2012. And most importantly to us, uh, in addition to his position as currently as ranking member, he served as chairman of the Foreign Affairs Subcommittee on Asia and the Pacific from 2013 to 2014. Congressman Chabot, it's my great pleasure to give the floor to you. Thank you for being with us. Thank you and good morning. Uh, it's great to be with you here uh, virtually. We'd like to do it in person, but I guess this is the next uh, best thing. Um, and as uh, the current ranking member and former chair uh, of the Asian Pacific Subcommittee, uh, I have two key priorities uh, that directly impact uh, ASEAN nations. Um, the first is addressing the generational challenge uh, posed by the Chinese Communist Party, the CCP, and its bid for regional and ultimately global hegemony. The second is fostering relationships with U.S. allies and partners in the Indo-Pacific region, especially through economic engagement. We could spend the entire time this morning probably uh, talking about the challenges posed by uh, China to each of our nations. However, as uh, those challenges apply to our relationship uh, with ASEAN, it really boils down to this. America supports ASEAN, not Beijing. And we will continue to support East ASEAN nation's sovereignty and territorial integrity. No matter the specific issue or challenge presented by the PRC, America will stand with ASEAN. Which brings me to my second priority, fostering positive relationships between ASEAN nations and the US, especially through economic engagement. Historically, the US has based its economy on trade and has thrived as a trading nation. Since our founding, Americans have realized that trade and economic prosperity are key to maintaining peace and preserving individual liberties, both at home and across the globe. Throughout our history, we have followed this principle in helping our allies and trading partners to build strong economies and even stronger societies. Today, the US is a key trading partner with ASEAN and our trading relationships has proved to be a valuable source of prosperity on both sides of the Pacific. In all of our countries, consumers and businesses have thrived through open markets and better access to quality goods at affordable prices. Going forward, I would like to see these ties develop uh, and even deepen so that our economies can further benefit each other for the good of all of our citizens. Trade will also be critical to the economic recovery following COVID. As we fight this deadly virus, America will continue to help all nations. But as we emerge from the pandemic, trade will again be center stage. If the pandemic has taught us anything, it's been that we cannot be so reliant on China for so many manufactured goods, especially medical supplies and safety equipment. And as we know, they tried to corner the market when it came to PPE and other critical uh, supplies. As a result, we need to build stronger trade relationships with nations that share our goals and principles. And that starts with the members of ASEAN. For my part as ranking member of the Asia Pacific Subcommittee, I'll continue to work to deepen our economic ties. And I hope and believe that the Biden administration will do the same thing. With this in mind, I welcome potential discussions on a digital trade agreement. So just to wrap up, as the report's name says, ASEAN matters for America. That's true whether it's our strategic, economic, or people-to-people -people ties. Our relationship with ASEAN is critical to U.S. engagement in Asia, and I look forward to continuing to work to strengthen that relationship in the years ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Congressman Javit. Uh, we will look forward to working with you on strengthening those ties, especially in trade. And uh, we definitely uh, support your idea about uh, digital trade. Uh, matter of fact, I wrote an op-ed on foreign policy in January supporting that idea. So we're grateful for your leadership in the Congress and uh, please feel free to reach out to any of our organizations if you need any assistance as you move forward. We, we're Thank grateful you. for your leadership. Thank you.
Now it's my great pleasure to uh, turn the floor over to one of our partners um, in this uh, uh, endeavor, uh, Sharon Lee Leon Sia. Uh, Sharon is uh, the senior fellow and coordinator of the ASEAN Study Center at the ICS Yushak, uh, Yusof Ishak Institute and is a value partner on this project. Sharon, thanks so much for being with us. I know it's late in Singapore, the floor is yours. Thank you, Alex. It's a quite a mouthful, isn't it? Well, good morning, good afternoon, and to those in Southeast Asia, a very good evening. It is a pleasure for me to be here for the launch of the ASEAN Matters for America, America Matters for ASEAN publication. My name is Sharon. I'm the coordinator of the ASEAN Studies Center, and I also started up a climate change in Southeast Asia program last year. So what I'm hearing from our distinguished speakers this morning confirms that we are moving in the right direction by starting up a new program. On behalf of the ICS Yusuf Ishak Institute here in Singapore, I, I would like to thank uh, my good friend, Dr. Satu, and his team, as, as well as Alex at the, uh, at the USABC, for the invitation to collaborate in this report. Um, ICS is really honored to once again be part of a meaningful publication. And I must say that I am a fangirl. I have been using this publication uh, in my days in the foreign affairs. The insights provided by this report are very much in line with the mandate and work of the ICS Yusuf Ishak Institute, and more specifically uh, with those of the ASEAN Study Center formed under its umbrella. The ASC conducts research on issues pertaining to the Association of Southeast Asian Nations as an institution and as a process. Through research, publications, conferences, and media engagement, we promote a greater understanding of ASEAN, contribute toward regional cooperation and integration, and call for collective ASEAN action and responses to pertinent regional issues, some of which our speakers have already mentioned, such as Myanmar. Already in the fifth edition, the ASEAN Matters Report is an invaluable and timely tracker of the interlinkages between both American and ASEAN societies that span a vast array of sectors, including trade and investment, security cooperation, climate action, and people-to-people -people exchanges, just to name a few. With this publication, we hope that not only will more light be shown on the United States' invaluable contribution towards Southeast Asian regional development, but that this can be a stepping stone to fostering greater ASEAN-US cooperation moving forward. Indeed, the findings of this report highlight that the underlying, highlight this underlying sentiment in Southeast Asia. If you take a long view of the US-ASEAN relationship, it has indeed proved resilient, its ties steadfast, its benefits mutual, and its interdependence undeniable. But putting the proverbial words into action, the US has made clear that ASEAN matters to America. Indo-Pacific coordinator Kurt Campbell recently indicated the US's pivot towards Southeast Asia, emphatically stating that the Biden administration will step up its game substantially in the region. And diplomatic engagement with Southeast Asia is seen as central to a free and open Indo-Pacific. But your flip side, Maxim, America matters for ASEAN must also count. Truth be told, US engagement has waxed and waned in the region over the last several years, given differing foreign policy priorities of previous administrations. The recent State of Southeast Asia 2021 survey conducted by my center showcased that there is a groundswell of trust and goodwill Southeast Asians have towards the US, despite your inconsistent regard in the last few years. As many as 55.4%, and this is up from 34.9% in 2020, of the regional respondents see the US as a reliable strategic partner and provider of regional security, despite Washington's general absence in the region under the Trump administration. And let us not forget, there is another power that is beginning to matter to ASEAN, and increasingly so. Today, China's and ASEAN's economies are inextricably linked. The Middle Kingdom's increasing economic influence has accrued benefits to its political strategic influence in the region, especially over states highly dependent on China's purse strings. China has been engaging in a charm offensive with the region, not to mention the COVID-19 diplomacy it has engaged in in the past year. China has also recently been pushing ASEAN for an elevation of ties to a comprehensive strategic partnership which the bloc might eventually be hard-pressed to ignore. 
The same survey that I cited earlier shows an overwhelming proportion of respondents, 76%, saying that it will not only regards China as the most influential economic power, but that they were worried about China's growing influence. Excellencies, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, both sides must not take the relationship for granted. Trust in the US has actually increased to 48.3%, up from 30.3% the past year, perhaps buoyed by higher expectations of greater US engagement in the region under the Biden administration. Indeed, the time is ripe for the US to step up its engagement, promising signs in the form of Deputy Secretary of State Wendy Sherman's visit to Indonesia, Thailand, and Cambodia in May, coupled by the upcoming planned visits to Singapore, Vietnam, and the Philippines this week by the Defense Secretary, give hope to beginnings of a new age of US-ASEAN engagement. We in Southeast Asia look forward to greater and more consistent US engagement with ASEAN. This is key for a stable balance of power and a multilateral order that we can coexist under because America truly does matter for ASEAN and we hope that ASEAN matters for America too. So congratulations to our partners again for another successful edition of a tremendously useful publication. And I look forward to listening to the robust discussions that will surely follow. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sharon. Thank you for your partnerships. Thank you for your words, which flow really nicely into our next speaker. Um, we are honored to have my friend Henrietta Levin from the National Security Council uh, speak with us in, in a moment. She's the director of, for Southeast Asia and ASEAN Affairs uh, at the White House and uh, reports into uh, Kirk Campbell, whose name has come up several times during our discussion, including just uh, now by, by Sharon. Um, we're excited to have uh, Henrietta with us. Uh, she has a vast background and has been at the National Security Council for quite a number of years. But prior to that, she had roles in the US Department of State where she was advisor to the US mission to the United Nations. She also served in the Bureau of East Asian and Pacific Affairs at the US Embassy in Beijing and spent time in the Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights and Labor. Henrietta, we're excited to have you. Obviously, there are lots of mentions to uh, Dr. Campbell and uh, his vision for the relationship between uh, ASEAN and the United States, and we're grateful for the role you play in your time today. The floor is yours. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alex. And I, I should start by passing along uh, Dr. Campbell's greetings. He really regrets that he couldn't be here. He's out on the road, um, but I, I know would have loved to see such a, an incredible group of folks talking, talking about Southeast Asia, and, and I'm personally honored to be here with you today to, to celebrate the launch of this incredible report of the ASEAN Matters for America report. So congratulations to Alex, the US ASEAN Business Council, the East West Center, and I see us on what really is a, an extraordinary uh, and helpful report. Um, I'm here to say that the Biden-Harris administration, as you've heard from Kurt many times, wholeheartedly agrees that ASEAN matters for the United States. And I am sure that our ASEAN partners agree that the United States matters for ASEAN. From the outset, this administration has underscored the importance of ASEAN and its central role in the Indo-Pacific. Our interim national security strategy prioritized multilateral engagement, which of course includes ASEAN, as well as deepening our partnerships with individual ASEAN member states. The interim NSS, of course, also emphasized the importance of partnering with the private sector and civil society in order to address pressing global challenges. And we value the strong relationships we have forged with companies and organizations that are doing great work in Southeast Asia, many of whom are represented here today. And we really look forward to continuing those partnerships. Southeast Asia, as so many of us have raised today, is a dynamic and exciting region, home to 650 million people. ASEAN's economy is innovative and full of potential, and that's why so many of the top US companies have found a home in Southeast Asia and conducted business there for years. In just the past few months, a US company won a contract for an 88 megawatt wind farm in Vietnam. Another is a partner in a groundbreaking $1 billion electric vehicle battery plant in Thailand. A US investment firm is building telecom tower platforms in the Philippines to strengthen and expand the Philippines telecom infrastructure. A US technology firm is partnering with Japan to clean up 
the Mekong River. And in Indonesia and elsewhere, U.S. companies provide critical training and, and skills development. And, and we're confident this commercial relationship, this economic relationship, will only deepen it in the years to come. Turning to our regional diplomacy just last week, as many of you know, we held a successful special ASEAN US foreign ministers meeting virtually, where Secretary of State Antony Blinken underscored uh, again our commitment to ASEAN. He emphasized our intent to deepen ties on a range of practical issues of critical importance to the United States and to ASEAN, including climate, women's empowerment, public health, transportation, and clean energy. At the meeting, the secretary, of course, also spoke to our efforts to collectively overcome the challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic and build back better. President Biden has committed that the United States will be an arsenal for COVID vaccines, and we're sharing those doses globally, including more than 11 million doses so far with ASEAN members. And we will provide more, including through COVAX, to which the United States is the world's largest donor. We are also working with countries in Southeast Asia to improve their ability to detect and respond to COVID-19 while also strengthening our collective health security for the future. With his ASEAN counterparts, the Secretary of State also reiterated the Biden-Harris administration's commitment to the rules-based order and international law, including with respect crucially to freedom of the seas. He reiterated our reduction of the PRC's expansive South China Sea maritime claims as unlawful in accordance with the 2016 Arbitral Tribunal Award. He also condemned the reprehensible actions of the Burmese military and demanded an end to violence, the release of those unjustly detained in Burma, including US citizens, and a swift return to democracy. He called on ASEAN members to quickly hold the Burmese military accountable to the ASEAN five-point consensus and promoting a return to democracy in Burma will remain a foremost priority for us in the region going forward. The Secretary's meeting with his ASEAN counterparts, of course, built on the Secretary of Defense's participation in the ASEAN Defense Minister's meeting plus in June and Deputy Secretary Sherman's meeting with ASEAN ambassadors in person at the ASEAN Secretariat during her trip to Jakarta at the end of May. And then of course, as we heard from DASD Ford, uh, next week, Secretary Austin will be traveling to Singapore, to Hanoi and to Manila. And then of course, we look forward to next month's ASEAN and ASEAN led foreign ministerial meetings. I think this tempo of engagement really reflects the foremost priority this administration places on Southeast Asia and our very real commitment to showing up. Moving forward, we will, of course, continue to offer a positive vision for how ASEAN fits squarely into US foreign policy. We will continue supporting ASEAN in fighting COVID-19 and promoting economic recovery to build back better from the pandemic. In partnership with our friends in Southeast Asia, we will continue to tackle the climate crisis to support the next generation of ASEAN leaders. Of course, uphold ASEAN centrality and, and much more that we can do together. I want to thank you again for the opportunity to, to speak today and to be a part of this incredibly useful discussion. We greatly value our partnership with both ASEAN countries and the private sector and civil society representatives doing so much in and for the region who are here today. Together, there is so much we can achieve and, and I look forward to continuing to, to hear from, from you in the course of, of today's program on opportunities to, to do even more in the region. Thank you again, I'll turn it back to Alex, thanks. Thank you so much, Henrietta. We're really grateful for your leadership in the White House and uh, appreciate your being with us and, and also good to hear that uh, uh, the White House and, and the Congress seem to be al aligned on ASEAN as well. So uh, we're, we're looking forward to the work ahead. It's not gonna be easy, but uh, we're grateful for all you've done and uh, all you and your colleagues throughout the government are doing to ensure that ASEAN continues to be front and center for the United States government. So thank you for being with us today. We'll continue the program. Um, and uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce two of our members who have joined us uh, by video. Kirk Laubitz leads uh, corporate affairs for Asia Pacific in exploration and production at Chevron. And then uh, Russell Mahoney leads uh, the Coca-Cola company's policy strategy across the ASEAN countries, Australia, New Zealand, and the South Pacific. Patrick, please uh, roll the videos, thanks. 
congratulations to the U.S. ASEAN Business Council on the publication of ASEAN Matters. The countries of ASEAN do indeed matter to the world, to the U.S., and to Chevron. Chevron is very proud of its long history, almost a century, fueling economic progress in the region. By any measure, ASEAN is the center of growth regionally and globally. We believe that collaboration is required for countries in ASEAN to achieve their economic, environmental, and energy security goals. And throughout the pandemic, Chevron has been providing the energy that people need to deal with the humanitarian and economic crisis. U.S. companies play an important role through their investment to help in the recovery and to make sure that we build back stronger. Working together, we'll emerge from the crisis ready to embrace the future. We are very proud to support the Council in demonstrating that ASEAN matters for America and that America matters for ASEAN. On behalf of the Coca-Cola Company, welcome to ASEAN Matters 2021, and I hope you're ready to talk about one of the most exciting and dynamic regions in the world. Coca-Cola Company has been a part of ASEAN for more than 100 years, and we operate in every country in the region. It's only through partnerships with organisations like the US ASEAN Business Council that we're able to do that effectively. And we see ASEAN as a huge engine room for growth for the Coca-Cola Company. But we also see it as a region where we can generate shared value. Through things like uh, reducing and recycling our plastic waste or helping bring clean drinking water to communities or indeed empowering women and youth within the region. These are things that are increasingly important to the Coca-Cola company and I think people generally. It's the shared mutual understanding of ASEAN and the US that I think will help us deliver on our goals in the region. And it's through organisations like US ASEAN Business Council and events like these that we'll be able to do that. We can bring a little bit of our home in the US to ASEAN and a little bit of ASEAN to the US. I hope you enjoy your time here and we are extraordinarily proud to be sponsors of this event. Thank you very much, uh, Kurt and, and, uh, um, and uh, sorry, um, Kurt and Kurt. So thank you very much. We're, we're grateful for your, for your time and uh, uh, we will now move on, and it's my great honor to introduce two-time U.S. Ambassador and Council Senior Vice President, Regional Managing Director, uh, Michael Mahalik. Mike, the floor is yours. Thanks very much, uh, Alex. Uh, as we have seen, uh, it's been very exciting to, to go through all of the speakers in the, in the uh, event that we've been having today. Uh, and as you've uh, heard, the U.S. government is looking to increase the level of engagement. This increased level also means that we're prioritizing health cooperation in the Asia Pacific, particularly focusing on COVID-19 relief and vaccine diplomacy. You've heard from other speakers firsthand how the COVID pandemic underscores the importance of our healthcare infrastructure and how healthcare and the economy are inextricably linked, linked both in the United States and in ASEAN. So it's important to understand where this linkage is going how to do it more comprehensively and how to do it better the next time we run into a, a pandemic. So during the conversation today, I'm pleased to welcome two distinguished guests with decades of experience in the healthcare sector. Manasi Tadis, President of Emerging Markets for Viatris, and Dorta Mickelson, MSD's President for the Asia Pacific. For our first question, I wanna start with uh, Dorta. And Dorta is the uh, president of MSD in the Asia Pacific based in Europe. Uh, and the Asia Pacific uh, region for MSD has about 7,000 employees across 12 key markets, which represent pretty much all of Asia ex China. So Dorta, given your perspective and from your role overseeing APAC, what is uh, your perspective on healthcare spending and its impact on the economy in the region, particularly in ASEAN? Thank you, uh, Mr. Ambassador, and thanks for, uh, for the uh, opportunity to participate in today's event. Um, so the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic has really underscored how vital 
health is to our shared economic prosperity. And as we've seen how the COVID-19 leads to national lockdowns, it has slowed down economic activities and in some cases even put um, industrial production on hold. Uh, it has caused a significant decline in GDP um, in uh, more than 3% here in, in Southeast Asia. Um, so as future pandemics will likely or could be more frequent and deadly, uh, we cannot wait uh, to overcome only COVID-19. That's a priority, of course, but we also need to think about uh, urgent global investments in, in the healthcare sector. Um, this was well noted recently during a panel presentation at the G20 finance ministers and central bank governors meeting, uh, which was held earlier this month, actually. That panel had called for 75 billion in investments over the next five years to combat future pandemics, uh, which may otherwise cost governments 700 times more than what had been proposed as additional investments. So clearly, investments in healthcare systems and preparedness is uh, well needed. Aside from tackling the pandemic, research by McKinsey has also shown that at a broader level, reducing the global disease burden can in fact add, add uh, 12 trillion US dollars to global GDP by 2040, uh, with a return of one to four, four dollars in every dollar invested. So this again uh, documents that investing in, uh, in health and in improvement of health can play a very meaningful role uh, in the long-term economy of the world. And health spending is therefore not only a cost, but an investment, an investment that impacts the uh, economy positively. And one area it impacts, of course, is productivity. Um, indeed, as we look at workforce productivity gains, uh, the example in Australia, uh, where the economy loses over half uh, a million full-time person years every year, uh, and that reduces the Australia productivity by 10%, and obviously is a drag on its economic growth. So as we think about such immediate concerns in the economy, a longer term horizon is also the uh, research and development uh, perspective. So. Just summarizing that, you know, health spending is, is not a cost, it's an investment in health, and health is the key to the wealth of, uh, of a country. Healthy people work longer, they work harder than sick people, of course, uh, and countries that improve their citizens' health uh, grow faster. So that's why we should focus on investing uh, in health, uh, not only for the current uh, COVID-19 pandemic, um, but also for the longer term and investing in health is an investment in the future of our region. Great, thanks very much. And uh, now I'd like to turn to Manasi Tarasi, who is currently the president of Emerging Markets at Viatris, a new kind of healthcare company created by the merger of Mylan and Upjohn, a legacy division of Pfizer. In his role, he oversees 125 markets, over 200 brands and leads a team of 3,500 people. Manasi, how do you see this relationship playing out in ASEAN and similar other similar markets in your purview? Thank you very much uh, for the question, Ambassador Mahalik, uh, and thank you for everyone uh, participating in this fireside chat, especially my partner, uh, Dorothe. Um, more than a year into this pandemic, uh, Ambassador, we've learned that health security is a matter of national economic importance, and that none of us are safe until all of us are safe. Um, investments in healthcare is directly related to economic development uh, of a country. As Dorothy uh, pointed out, a healthy population is a productive and happy population. Uh, Well-considered and consistent uh, healthcare investments build a resilient healthcare system that will enable us to be able to meet the challenges of the future and protect the most vulnerable amongst us, uh, which were disproportionately affected by this pandemic. For me, uh, both uh, personally and professionally, increasing access to healthcare is a key priority. We must continue to invest uh, to be able to innovate uh, in order to strengthen our healthcare systems because fostering a, a more resilient and inclusive healthcare system will be able to help our societies move forward uh, together. At Beatrice, uh, we've worked hard to be able to reach communities uh, on the ground to be able to provide access to vital healthcare. Uh, as the WHO points out, 85% of all non-communicable deaths, uh, and I'll, I'll bring that linkage back a little bit later, are happening in emerging markets. Um, and, these, and in these emerging markets, uh, 125 plus of them, we, we do some of our best work in providing and establishing effective and sustainable partnerships in order again to reach uh, the most vulnerable communities 
with healthcare that suits them, that is tailor-made for their societal, environmental, and unique challenges, uh, which are very different than uh, developed markets. And just to give you an example here, very specific to ASEAN, last year we hosted a, a first of its kind uh, partnership for change summit in, in Singapore. Um, this was to be able to stimulate uh, changes in the management of non-communicable diseases, some of the underlying causes of, of COVID related deaths uh, across emerging markets, bringing health experts and other leaders representing both medical and professional societies, academic institutions, patient associations, um, and others uh, across uh, Southeast Asia, but also including Latin America, uh, Africa, the Middle East, to be able to uh, exchange experiences and insights on the best practices to be able to address uh, this pandemic, uh, but also the related NCD burden that these markets are facing. Mm. Uh, thanks very much for that, that uh, uh, answer. But obviously, over the past 18 months, we've seen a tremendous amount of government spending to combat COVID-19 around the world, uh, coupled with a severe downturn in the global economy. But uh, Manasi, let's take a little bit more a deeper dive into what you were just saying. And that is, where is the balance between combating COVID-19 or the next pandemic? Uh, and then also trying to address some of the other important healthcare uh, challenges, like you just mentioned with uh, rising NCDs. Uh, Ambassador, there's no easy answer to this, uh, but I'll take a stab at it. The recovery uh, across Southeast Asia from a healthcare spending perspective will, will remain challenging as countries confront uh, unexpectedly strong COVID outbreaks in multiple waves, as we all know. Uh, most uh, health ministries across the region have increased their budgets but this increase is gonna be insufficient to be able to cope uh, with the cost of COVID-19 and the physical burdens that have been in, uh, accumulated over time. Uh, governments are seeking you know, cost-effective strategies to be able to manage public health expenditure while expanding broad primary care-based uh, access and disease screenings to be able to reduce uh, catastrophic health expenditures. To me, that, that's one of the keys here is to be able to, to get ahead of it and to make sure that we've got health systems that are equipped uh, to be able to avert uh, some of the uh, daunting statistics that we see. Um, in ASEAN, uh, giving you the emerging markets perspective according to the WHO, in ASEAN, the, the leading cause of death is non-communicable diseases, accounting for some 62% of all deaths. That's about eight and a half million people uh, per annum. Um, and as the WHO uh, again points out, approximately 50% of these occur in people under the age of 70. So preventable uh, diseases and a relatively uh, young uh, population. Four major NCDs uh, for, for those uh, not in the field, we're talking about common issues that you know of, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, cancers, uh, respiratory diseases. Uh, those are leading to 80% plus of these premature deaths uh, as, uh, as uh, the medical folks uh, define it. And then the other piece that we can't um, shy away from at this point is mental disorders, uh, the fifth leading contributor to these NCDs and frequently comorbidities um, for the four major NCDs that, that we've just described. But overall in ASEAN, 44% um, of uh, what is defined as total disability adjusted life years are, are lost specifically uh, around NCDs and mental health being uh, the largest one. Mm -hmm. So uh, for me, Ambassador, uh, the, the scale of this premature and preventable uh, deaths, NCD, uh, COVID is somewhat related. And uh, again, I'll come back to that. Will require yeah. serious public health uh, uh, concern and, and require a whole system approach, warranting a response not only from doctors and, and allied healthcare professionals, but also policymakers, educators, uh, private sector, society, all of us, uh, including the patient at the center, in order to be able to, to help uh, move this forward. Right. Well, Dorta, I'd like to direct the same question to you. And rather than framing this as a trade-off uh, during the next pandemic or other similar emergency, how do you see governments and private companies striking the balance? And, and what are your views on some of the other major healthcare issues that need to be considered uh, within that balance? Yeah, certainly. Let me follow up on my my co-panelist, uh, Manassi's uh, comments and, and say it's, it's not easy. Um, we are gonna have to do both. Uh, we are gonna have to overcome the current uh, COVID-19 uh, battle. Um, where yesterday, I think we've seen more than 6 million confirmed cases uh, and thousands and thousands of deaths. So 
while we have, you know, vaccine supply shortage, there are logistic hurdles in the rollout of uh, vaccination. It does seem to be the way um, forward, um, and especially due to the challenge of new waves of infection and, and variants. Um, and I would say we're fortunate um, because the biopharmaceutical industry, you know, continues to invest in innovations. And that's why, you know, there is hope uh, that we can battle this, uh, this pandemic. Um, besides the breakthrough in, in vaccines uh, by a number of companies, uh, you know, as a result of decades of uh, investments into research and development, um, there are also uh, innovation and progress forthcoming in COVID-19 treatments. Um, for instance, MSD has a program there now moving into phase three. So, you know, um, we hope, of course, all that there is going to be positive news, but data still um, to show. Um, I do also agree um, that there is a need to return to care to other diseases than COVID-19 uh, and especially to the NCDs, the non-communicable uh, diseases. Um, critical care has been delayed. Routine vaccinations have been either stopped or uh, postponed. Uh, and health screening, for instance, for cancer and other chronic diseases, we know uh, are obviously being put on, on pause. Um, so there is data available, for instance, on vaccination, um, that there has to be now uh, a, um, a, a revitalization of the back to care and some of our basic vaccination programs. The WSO has now shown uh, that among you know, 68 countries in the world, um, there is an estimated 880 million children uh, under the age of one who has not been vaccinated or who is now currently under vaccinated. Um, so specifically, that means like, you know, common diseases like measles, uh, rubella, um, and polio uh, outbreaks uh, are threatening. And there is a number of campaigns there that has been postponed. Um, and measles, for instance, that we most of us know, uh, is even more contagious than COVID-19. So that could be only a matter of time. So we do need to restart the routine vaccination programs uh, that were in place uh, even before COVID. And in oncology, as I said, um, you know, there we actually don't have time. <laughs> so uh, people who are delaying potentially cancer diagnosis or cancer care, um, don't have time and uh, and may die as uh, as a consequence of postponing uh, the cancer care uh, that they should get. Um, so there is now also uh, numbers documenting uh, that. Uh, and as we look at the prevalence in our region, in the ASEAN region, uh, the expectation is actually that the number of cancer uh, cases are going to grow tremendously and much more than in the rest of the world in the years to come. So there's also a real challenge in, in investing and refocusing in parallel with COVID-19 on, on cancer care. So right. I do think that we're going to have to balance and going to have to do both. And hopefully we can do that in, in public-private partnership uh, across the region. Right. Well, that's an excellent segue. Can you, you know, we're just, we're, we are out of time, but I want to press it a little bit anyway. Can you give us why don't you give us maybe one lesson that uh, you can think of from the past uh, experience that we've had with COVID-19, the pandemic, in terms of the, the balance and the investment that we need for, for uh, health care to moving forward to figure out how can the private sector work with, partner with governments to ensure that we do it better the next time. So give me about a minute and then I'm going to ask Manasseh to do the same thing. Thank you. Um, I, I do believe we, and I'm very hopeful, I do believe we're seeing tremendous, um, you know, efforts and outcomes of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and how private and public can work together. Um, I do think moving forward, it's about uh, ensuring sustainable funding. Um, so we do need governments to invest uh, in the area of health. Uh, I spoke to earlier about, you know, productivity and, of course, health of the population as the, as the path forward to prosperity. Um, and second, uh, also that we work together to ensure sustainable uh, access uh, based on, of course, data, health technology assessment methodologies so that, um, you know, we assess the value of medicines to, uh, in a given, given country and in a given region. Um, so that every country, uh, you know, 
utilizes the technology, the innovations that they have at hand, and, and do that in a collaboration with uh, with the industry, with academia, uh, of course with patients. You know, which is a very important voice uh, in healthcare system, um, and uh, and with other stakeholders who have an interest in health. Great, Manasi, I'll give you the last word. Perfect, What's your Manasi. view on the same question? Uh, I'm, I'm going to preface it with uh, a few data points, uh, uh, Ambassador, but just so we can all walk away. 41 million people on a per annum basis globally die from NCDs. What we know is that 60 to 90 percent of the COVID deaths had some underlying NCD. As I mentioned a little earlier, eight and a half million of these people are, are uh, dying annually in uh, ASEAN. Um, so we clearly know that. We clearly know that we have to do better. Um, in the early stages of this pandemic, what we saw was hesitancy for patients to be able to receive care, uh, out of stock supplies, uh, diagnosis uh, being uh, delayed and in some cases canceled. Dorothy talked about it in, in critical areas like cancer and for that matter, underlying chronic conditions. That's almost a death sentence in, in a lot of ways. And so how do we move towards a, a patient-centric universal healthcare uh, model that a lot of our markets are, are moving towards. Uh, there's a lot that we can learn from this pandemic. I'll, I'll give a, a shout out to a particular publication, um, the Risk Management and, and Healthcare Policy the Journal, that has published a study which has a five-point plan um, specific to ASEAN. Uh, it's about policy gaps. It's about addressing clinical practice shortcomings um, and, and a number of other areas. But for me, the, the takeaway, Ambassador, is really getting patients at the center of the treatment educating them, making sure that they're participating in their, in their own healthcare. And as such, one patient at a time, we can get to the level of, of public health uh, advances that we'd like to see. The, the, the link between economic and, and healthcare at a country level, at a region level, and at a global level is no doubt there. Uh, how do we move ahead to make sure for the next pandemic, for the next outbreak, uh, we're, we're much better prepared than we were at this time around. But thank you very much uh, for this uh, important conversation. All right, well, there you go, Alex and Satu. That's kind of a, a serious note uh, to end uh, the uh, end of, the, of this wonderful event, but it also shows that there's still hope out there through patient-centered care, through working in partnership with governments as this wonderful publication that, uh, that we're talking about today is uh, uh, one way in which we can begin uh, or which we can continue to move this partnership forward and uh, make the best advantage of the partnership that, uh, that we develop between ASEAN and the United States. So in fact, ASEAN matters for America and America does matter for ASEAN. And I'm gonna turn the floor back over to you guys for your closing remarks. Thank, thank you, you very so, much. Thank you so much, Mike. Uh, Manessi, uh, Dorta, thank you for being with us and sharing your great insights. Obviously, the United States has to pay attention to what's happening in ASEAN in both communicable and non-communicable disease. And uh, we look forward to uh, continuing to partnership with uh, MSD and Veritas uh, as we, we move forward. As a matter of fact, I wanna thank uh, both of your companies for being platinum sponsors today. Um, and we're so grateful for all of your insights. I know you're both busy. I know we've run over a little bit. So thank you. Please forgive us. But I think it's important that we have this conversation. I also want to thank Google, their other platinum sponsor, as well as AIG, Chevron, and Coca-Cola, our gold sponsors, 3M, City, HP, Marriott, Oracle, UL, Visa, and VMware, who were our silver sponsors. Without our sponsors, we could not be here today. So thank you all so much. Uh, we also, without our partners, we couldn't be here today. So I want to thank uh, ICS Yusuf Ishak Institute, as well as, of course, uh, East West Center and Satu. I'm going to turn the floor over to you to have the final word and to close us on why ASEAN matters for America and America matters for ASEAN. Thanks. Well, thank you very much indeed, Alex, uh, and the U.S. ASEAN Business Council and all its sponsors. I uh, really want to thank you uh, for your support of this effort uh, on the fifth edition. Uh, it's really great. I want to particularly thank not only Alex, but his whole entire team. It's always dangerous to mention names, but I'm going to wade into that danger a little bit and thank Mark Mealy, Liz Dugan, obviously Ambassador Mihalik, Bernie Baskin, uh, and the whole team over there for just, I think, a terrific partnership, uh, which has gone through, uh, as I said, the fifth edition now. I also want to thank Sharon Sia and her director at the Yusuf Ishak Institute 
Choi Shin Kwok, uh, who has been a long supporter of this project from its very uh, inception. Um, and uh, finally, I want to thank uh, our entire team at the East West Center uh, in Washington, particularly Sarah Wong on the launch event and all the logistics and complexities that went into that. Uh, and she does a, a great job of that. And of course, Michelle Reyes behind the scenes. Uh, you haven't seen her face on the on the on the um, Zoom call today, but she is the master of the publication and design and has been working very carefully with all of us, uh, looking at every comma, every number, every uh, design. So thank you, uh, Michelle Reyes and the entire team. I wanna remind everyone that ASEAN Matters for America is really a flagship of our partnerships with USABC and ICES, uh, Yusuf Ishak Institute, um, but it is also part of the larger Asia Matters for America that you see behind me. And I would urge you to please go to asiamattersforamerica.org and look at our Korea, Asia, ASEAN, India, uh, Taiwan, upcoming Taiwan and other uh, versions, because I think as an institute uh, established by the US Congress, that is to say the East West Center, established by the US Congress to promote better understanding and relationships between the peoples uh, governments of Asia, and when I say that, that includes obviously the private sectors and the businesses, communities, civil society organizations. We are absolutely dedicated to building a U.S. ASEAN relationship that is part of a larger U.S. Asia relationship. And for that, I thank you all. I bid you good day, good night, good evening, and also, most importantly, be well, be safe, and be helpful. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again for the launch of the sixth edition. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you, everybody.